As the war in Gaza continues, the Biden White House is facing fresh pressure over how to approach its relationship with Israel. On that and more, we turn to the analysis of Brooks and Capehart. That's New York Times columnist David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, associate editor for The Washington Post. It's good to see you both. You too, Jeff. So, David, I want to start with your reaction to Israel agreeing to put in place four-hour daily humanitarian pauses in its assault on Hamas in northern Gaza. Yeah, I think it's a start. Uh, you know, I think that Israel has, a, has to do a few things here. The first is obviously defeat Hamas. There can be no peace in the Middle East as long as Hamas is there. And so that's what you might call the near enemy. But the real enemy and the far enemy is Iran. And I was with a group of foreign policy experts uh, last week, and one of them made a, a smart observation, which was, of all the nations of the world, who's had the most effective foreign policy in the last several years? And it's been Iran. They've surrounded Israel with a bunch of uh, terror groups, Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad, Hamas. And in order to defeat Ham Iran, or at least stand up to Iran, you've got to have help in the, in the neighborhood. And so you've got to have help in Saudi Arabia, in, in Egypt. And those regimes want to help you. They don't like Iran at all. But their populations are getting more and more furious about what's happening in Gaza. And so in order to defeat Iran and keep your allies in with you, you've just got to be as humanitarian as possible. Hmm. And so I, I think even aside from the, the moral reasons to spare the suffering of the people in Gaza, there are strategic reasons Israel should be as humanitarian as possible. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, when David talks about the, the moral and um, strategic reasons. The administration was pushing for a multi-day pause. Uh, and John Kirby, the National Security Council spokesperson, said that these you know, four-hour-long pauses were a direct result of President Biden's uh, contacts and conversations with Netanyahu. Right. This is the, pre this is the public manifestation of hours, if not weeks, of, of private consultations, um, uh, um, I was going to say lapel shaking, but of the president, the secretary of state, and his shuttle diplomacy trying to impress upon the, um, Prime Minister Netanyahu that you know you must you must have if you're not going to do a ceasefire, which the administration is is against, at least do a humanitarian pause. Gaza is suffering. Um, there's no water. There's no food. There's no fuel. There's none of the basic necessities. You must defend yourself against Hamas, but you also must do so in a manner befitting a small-D democratic nation. And so it'd be great if it were over several days, but the fact that there, is a, there will be pauses over hours it is the result of the president pushing Prime Minister Netanyahu to do the right thing, and hopefully that, the, you know, that that will lead to more. What's your assessment of the way in which President Biden has navigated these competing interests and competing pressures? Yeah, I think he's done qu quite well. Uh, you know, I think the, the clarion call uh, that Hamas has to be defeated, Hamas is a threat to the region. Uh, I think he, frankly, he might be alone in his administration uh, in feeling that so strong, not quite alone, but he's certainly been a force. And so I think he's put America and rallied the West and to an idea that Israel, there was, a, there was relative stability, and Hamas is not like Fatah. Uh, Hamas is something different. And I think one of the tragedies of what's happened over the last month is in a lot of people's minds that difference between Hamas and Fatah has been elided. And Fatah, the Palestinian Authority, they recognize the state of Israel. They're, they've been trying, you know, to get to some sort of two-state solution. They play rough. And, you know, even in the Yasser Arafat days, there was terrorism. But often it was terrorism to, with the purpose of building leverage to get to a better settlement. Hamas is not like that. Hamas is about homicide. And it's about genocide and it's about mass murder. And I think the president's been very clear about that. And it's because he's been doing this in the region for a long time. So I think his, this is a case where his age has really paid off. Mm -hmm. Let's shift our focus to Tuesday night's election results. One thing was certainly clear, that abortion rights, reproductive rights, abortion access is politically popular no matter where it appears on the ballot post the Supreme Court overturning Roe. What were some of your other takeaways? Um, that, that was the main thing, whether you are in a so-called blue state, but especially if you're in a red state. I, I, I looked at sort of, let's just take Governor Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, who made it a point of saying, I will go for a 15-week abortion ban. Just give me both, give Republicans control in both uh, bodies of the legislature, and I'll get it done. 
So on Earth 2, that plays well because that's what they want. But the rest of us on Earth 1, and particular, particularly suburban white women in the northern Virginia suburbs, looked at what happened with Dobbs and like, no, 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 no. We've seen what has happened in other states around the country, particularly Florida, with a six-week ban. We do not want that to happen here. Um, so he, Glenn Youngkin didn't get what he wanted in, in, in Virginia. Ohio Republicans didn't get what they wanted. Um, Ohio, that Trump won by double digits, mm -hmm. now has in its state constitution, Ruby Red, Ohio, access to abortion. Uh, Kentucky, uh, Governor Bashir re-elected with that unbelievably powerful ad at the very end of the young woman who looks directly at the camera and blames David Cameron for wanting to institute a policy that would force her to carry her stepfather's child after he raped her. Um, for Republicans who think that running on abortion is going to be the winning formula in 2024, Tuesday night should have been the wake-up call. And David, you wrote a column this past week where the thesis was, was pretty evident based on the headline. It was Democrats, you can chill out now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why? We, we go for subtlety in yeah, our headlines right. at the New right. York Times. Right. Yeah, and I, you know, it was kind of, it was, a, it was an emotional roller coaster week. So in the beginning of the week, there's the Times Siena poll, which shows Trump in a bunch of battleground states, and Democrats are like, ah, hair on fire, those who have hair. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and then the election results come in, and yet again, as consistently since Donald Trump has been elected president, Democrats have a good night. And so, my, one of my points was that the polls have to be looked at with a, a grain of salt. And not just because all polls have to be looked at with a grain of salt, because we're in a different culture now. Through most of our careers, presidential approvals go up and down. But over the last, since 2005, the country's been such a sour mood, presidents have spent 77% of their time with their favorability ratings underwater. People just blame the president. So when a pollster calls them and people are upset with the country, they say, yeah, I'm against the president. They're venting. They're not voting. And so my point was, uh, in this kind of climate, you have to, we have to understand that the, what, what people tell posters could be about how they feel, mm. but it's not necessarily the decision they're going to make in a year. Meantime, Democratic Senator uh, from West Virginia, Joe Manchin, announced this past week that he's not going to seek re-election. In some ways, it's not surprising, given that it would have been really difficult, if not impossible, for him to win re-election. But what's the, what's the impact on the Senate and on the party? Well, the impact on the Senate is um, the Democrats are going to lose a seat that they pretty much thought that they were going to lose, and that it was going to be a very tough, a very tough re-election effort on Senator Manchin's part if he went for it, most likely was going to lose. It, it, immediately, it means that their chances of hanging on to the Senate just diminish because it's basically 50-50. And so that means that uh, Senator Tester in Montana, um, Senator Sherrod Brown in Ohio, at least it gives the party, the, the Democrats, more time, more energy, more money to focus on those races. But I would also say focus in on Texas and Congressman Colin Allred, who's looking to unseat uh, Senator Cruz. Tough, that's going to be an uphill battle. Everyone thought that they were going to be the one. Beto O'Rourke thought yeah. he was going to be the one to be the next senator from Texas. But I think Congressman Allred could be that person. And Senator Manchin getting out maybe frees up some resources for the DNC to head push his way. Yeah. What's the legacy, legacy that Joe Manchin leaves behind? Uh, he saved the Biden administration. And so the Biden administration, and if you remember a few years ago, wanted to spend $4 trillion to pump up the economy. Uh, and he said, no way, no way. It was more like $1 trillion. And as a result, if we had spent $4 trillion instead of $1 trillion, the inflation, which we really suffered from, would have been astronomical. And uh, the Biden administration would be in much worse shape if our inflation had hit, like, double digits, which it could have, uh, if overstimulating to that degree. So Democrats don't like Joe Manchin, but he did save their bacon. Before we uh, wrap up, I want to put a marker on these uh, latest comments from former President Donald Trump, who in an interview with Univision uh, last night threatened to weaponize the DOJ against his opponents if he's reelected. They've done indictments in order to win an election. They call it weaponization. And the people aren't going to stand for it. But yeah, they have done something that allows the next party. I mean, if somebody, if I happen to be president and I see somebody who's doing well and beating me very badly, I say, go down and indict them. Mostly that would be, you know, they would be out of business. They'd be out. They'd be out of the election. 
I spoke with uh, Devlin Barrett, a Washington Post reporter, uh, this past week, who not only reported that former President Trump wanted to do it, but that there are lawyers, conservative lawyers, who are putting together a plan and writing executive orders uh, for how he could do it if he wins re-election. It's, it's got a name. It's called Project 2025. Those plans, it's called the 180-day playbook. They, people who want to be a part of that administration, if it comes in, they can send in their resumes to that particular project. And what the president, what the former president said there, what he is saying are things he tried when he was president. Remember, at the very end of his administration, he was upset with Bill Barr because Bill Barr didn't move to arrest Joe Biden when Joe Biden was his political opponent. Yeah. Well, well the word for it is authoritarianism, <laughs> <laughs> indicting your political opponent. And, and I do think there, there's, another, there's another Republican or Trumpy plan, which would, right now in the federal government, there are 4,000 political employees who the president appoints and thousands and thousands of civil servants. And there's a, a, a plan afoot to gut as many as 50,000 of the civil servants and replace them with partisan political people. That's Schedule F. Yeah, Schedule yeah. F. And that, that, would, um, that, would, that would decimate our civil service, but it would also lead to, apparently, the complete politicization of the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just idle talk by Trump. There's actually plans afoot, as Jonathan said, uh, to put this into effect, and that is truly scary. David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart, thanks as always. Thanks, John. Thank you.